Good morning. So this is the breakout group Ola, that is dedicated to business and market. And Ola, as the participants are joining uh, breakout room, um, we will explain a little bit Ola, what these Ola, topics are about, what we are doing in Climate Europe to how you can participate in those processes and how you might be part of the community of practice that Climate Europe too is aiming to to develop. My name is Jaro Misiak and I'll, uh, I, I will be your moderator for the next couple of hours. I'll, uh, and together with me is uh, Andreas. I will give him the floor in a second. So I, I work for Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change, which is the la institution that is la, leading the, the work stream on business and innovation. Over to you, Andreas. Thanks very much, much, Jaro. My name is Andreas Wilbock, and uh, I'm working at the Climate Service Center Germany, GERIX. That's uh, an institution at the Helmholtz Center here in Hamburg. Um, I'm a meteorologist by background and climate modeling and uh, worked many years in communication and uh, for marine research and climate research and here at uh, Herion, we are co-leading with the uh, Climate Kick, which is our partner in the work package four of Climate Europe 2, uh, which is on um, the market development. Um, yeah, and today I think uh, we want to present and discuss with you uh, these two work packages, business innovation, uh, as uh, um, Yara just pointed out, and the market development. And what we want to do there in the next month and years to come and discuss this with you and uh, i think we heard yesterday in the the opening session uh, already uh, quite a bit about the developments of the climate the climate services market in the past its complexity and challenges um, for future development and also uh, opportunities, um, for instance, due to standardization, we have a special session on that as well, uh, and business innovation. And uh, that's what we will um, partly focus on in, in our session today. Um, so, um, and I think with this uh, very brief introduction, I will uh, go back to Yaro and he uh, picks up the, the next item on our agenda. Thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, uh, initially, we thought to, uh, uh, to use some uh, um, interactive uh, methods and techniques to get uh, your views, uh, who you are, where you come from, what you are interested in. But in order to keep it simple and not confusing for you, I would like to invite you to use the chat. If you could uh, briefly introduce yourself, uh, um, who you are, uh, and uh, how your work is related to business uh, and market uh, with climate services, and perhaps your expectations. So feel free to use the chart as, uh, as much as possible. Uh, we will be using the chart uh, to ask questions and engage you, but we will use the chart also afterwards when we assess the performance of this session and look into all the evidence that we have gathered. Uh, with that, I would uh, briefly uh, introduce what we are doing in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, business innovation. Um, you know that we start from uh, from a, uh, a situation where climate services can play a uh, enormous role in accelerating climate adaptation, making the resource use more efficient to reduce the risk and prepare uh, for coping with climate change. But this potential has not been fully exploited. It's heavily, still heavily supply driven. It's heavily based on strategic, strategic investment into computational power, into delivery of climate knowledge, into exploring how the climate knowledge that has been developed in number of initiatives can be translated into something which is very usable, used and useful for the different users. And this is extremely important. Uh, this job has not been done yet. So we still struggle a little bit in, uh, in making the, the step from the enormous wealth of climate information that is available from Copernicus Climate Change Service, from uh, different initiatives to produce a uh, global or regional climate simulation and forecast um, to the stage where this information 
is translated into knowledge and knowledge that can allow, really influence the decision making and, uh, and policy making. So what we are planning to do in this project in order to uh, make that step or, uh, or to, to improve the uptake of climate services through business innovation. So in the first place, we are going to do a typology of uh, the benefits from climate services. This is very important. In terms of business innovation, it's part of what we call uh, value proposition. Value proposition, that means so, uh, how this climate service or the knowledge that is produced by this climate service can be used in my context, in my environment, in order to uh, deliver on some specific uh, um, uh, key performance indicators of my business or of, uh, of my role. So this is extremely important. Um, we do the typology first by looking into literature, talking to the knowledgeable people, reviewing what has been done. And for every type of benefit, and the benefit might not only be financial or economic, it might be environmental, it might be social benefits in terms of increased resilience, for example. So those, this typology will be accompanied by a, a, a set of methods, how to how to assess these, uh, these benefits, how to make sure that those benefits are delivered to those that might really benefit from them. So this is one part of, uh, of what we are doing, and we will uh, hear more about it uh, from, uh, from our distinguished speakers that I will introduce in, in a minute. Um, and then the second part of our work is uh, what the businesses, uh, the purveyor of climate services, what the businesses do in order to deliver this value proposition, but also retain a part of this uh, for making the delivery of these services uh, sustainable and financially uh, viable. So there are different ways how to innovate with the business model and uh, how to make sure that uh, the companies all together align with the, uh, with the public uh, and uh, community objectives and deliver um, in a sustainable and financially uh, viable way, uh, the services that are needed. So this is what we will be talking about, you know, from our perspective, from business and innovation. But I would like to hand over to Andreas to hear a little bit more about what we will be hearing from the market perspective and the market surveys, market strategies to boost the, uh, the, the, the market with the climate services. Over to you, Andreas. Yeah, thank you, Yaro, um, for this uh, introduction to the book package three here. Uh, we are also um, looking into the market development. And uh, one of uh, our key tasks uh, in the beginning is to uh, do an inventory of the current markets of climate services, uh, including the analysis of gaps, possible pathway for future developments. So we uh, know about established sectors uh, in climate services, but there are also emerging ones, uh, in particular due to climate adaptation and mitigation. Uh, and uh, this would uh, will serve uh, to, to showcase good practices uh, and learn from, perhaps also learn from failures, not only from the good, but also from perhaps not so good climate services. Um, this will, should uh, help us to increase the performance of uh, climate services in future. Uh, and uh, this will um, also be very important, I think, to increase trust uh, and transparency within climate services. We heard about this, uh, the issue of trust, um, which is very important if we are concerned with the users of climate services. Um, uh, yesterday uh, in the introductory session, uh, and so we um, want to do this by um, defining standards for, we say, guiding principles for a high quality climate services. This is a big expression. So you, you might think about, first of all, what uh, high quality climate services are all about. And this is something uh, we will do. And we will try to um, develop a common understanding of uh, what um, high quality climate services are for us or uh, and uh, what kind of uh, these um, high quality or parts of these high quality services 
might be standardized because in the end of Climate Europe 2, one of the major goals is to develop standardization for climate services to uh, to help also uh, to help the user, but also the um, um, providers of climate services to increase their um, uh, their quality, to make the market more transparent, um, to increase the trust for climate services. So this is what we, uh, in the core of the program, would like to do, uh, and also. Um, this should um, facilitate also the market for climate services in uh, in future, so for, to, for the further development of the market. Uh, and this is also part of our work within um, this work package for on market development. I think this should be all fine for the for the first interaction. To, Fantastic, to Andreas. That was really good. I'll, uh, so before turning to our distinguished panelists, I would like to ask whether there are any questions from the audience, whether somebody would like to post a question or share an interesting expectation from this session or from this project. If not, no problem. You can post your question in the chat. We will be following and monitoring the chat. If you have a burning question, please raise your hand and we will invite you to take the floor. So with that, I would like to move to our first panel. And first panel is completely female. So I'm pleased to invite Professor Kirsten Halsnes from the Danish Technical University in Copenhagen. Many of you know Kirsten is a professor for climate economics and risk management. And she's also an international expert on the economics of climate change. Uh, she's on uh, IPCC Assessment Report 6 uh, uh, author, and also uh, co-authored a number of international studies on sustainable development. So this is our first uh, panelist. Our second panelist is uh, uh, Prof uh, Francesca La Rosa, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at the uh, uh, K. TH Royal Institute of Technology in um, Stockholm, <coughs> and previously a uh, uh, postdoc at the University College London, and uh, before then, and still working with us, uh, a fellow of Euro Mediterranean Centre on Climate Change. So I invite uh, Kirsten and Francesca to unmute your, uh, your microphone and your uh, switch on your uh, video camera. Join us on the floor. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you, Kirsten. And then I, I'm really uh, very curious to, to listen to your introductory talk. Like, Kirsten, would you like to uh, be the first and uh, take yes. us through the different benefits? Yeah, no, and uh, thank you for this very impressive introduction, which uh, is building very high expectations to what I can bring, maybe too high. But uh, I would like to share my screen because I made a little uh, PowerPoint presentation. Please do. Yeah. Yes. And it's working, I hope. Yes, it is working in the full presentation mode. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, um, since I'm an economist, uh, actually values is something that you are defining in relation to what are you doing? to the people or the decision makers uh, or the business that uh, are actually using climate services, what do they get out of that? Uh, I don't know if I can uh, move my, yeah. So uh, actually, I thought that one way to, uh, to present a broad perspective of what values are is uh, to look a little bit of what is at stake when climate hazards are happening? Because I see climate services as a service that can help people to avoid some very negative consequences of different sorts of uh, climate hazards. And I have uh, taken a few examples here from uh, Denmark because we talk a lot uh, with the local governments and uh, they are making a lot of plans that will protect them against different sorts of uh, climate hazards. So if we start in the first uh, left corner, uh, you can see a map 
of how different uh, buildings and roads in a city called Odense in Denmark uh, could be uh, flooded. And this is the city where the big, uh, the famous fairy tale has Christian Andersen uh, grew up. So you can see that uh, if we had some good climate services, we could help the local government, but also the house owners, and it could be people using the roads. We also have uh, industry buildings to know how they could protect themselves against flooding. And the climate services uh, then could reduce the risk. And uh, in that context, it's actually quite important to be accurate about where the flooding is. Because if you want to make adaptation, you should do it in the right place where the water is coming. Then if we move to the, to the bottom of the slide, I've shown some nature conservation areas in Olsen. They could also be in, in, at risk by flooding. So it's also a value that you protect something you want to keep. Maybe some biodiversity, some special uh, areas with different uh, recreative values and so forth. So a value is also something you want to protect. And you have a, if you have a good climate service telling you how these uh, nature areas could be affected by climate hazards, that's also a value. And then one very interesting thing that they're making in Copenhagen that you see in the top, right top of the slide, they are accounting what they call city life. And uh, I think this is interesting because the logic is, as you see with uh, um, the green dots, is the areas where the pedestrians are passing. The green is, uh, the red is where they are staying. And the logic of that is that it is a value of people if they want to stay or want to pass. So therefore, a value is something that people appreciate. And uh, in that context, climate services should also help them to uh, find out whether we are disrupting some areas that are very valuable to people because they are staying there, which shows there is a value. So uh, now I'm getting back to a little bit like what uh, Yaro already talked about, what we want to do. I can do it short because Yaro already went into detail on that. We want to do a scoping review to identify how values have been defined and assessed in the literature, then we would like to have dialogues. So we hope that some of you listening to this uh, webstyle presentation will tell us um, about examples. Why would you like to use climate services? Have you good experience? Have you bad experience? How big is the gap between what we want to deliver and what you can use? And then we will also go more into depth with some case studies trying to discover areas where climate service delivery has been successful and not so successful. And then finally, because we have limited time, I would emphasize that when you're talking about markets, markets is supply and demand meeting each other as illustrated with the handshake. And the climate services only generate economic and social values if they are uptake, uptaken and if they are really used by the people who need it, and they lead to reduction of the risks of different climate hazards. And this comes directly out of the EU roadmap. So therefore I like to uh, emphasize that we should really look at where climate services have been uptaken and how we could promote that climate services are really uptaken. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Kirsten. I will get back to you with a question right after La Francesca short introduction. So there's an interesting aspect and perspective on how to capture the benefits and how to assess them. Francesca, turning to you, what can you share with us about the sustainable business innovation for climate services? I'll begin with a presentation, to be honest, and then uh, based on sure. uh, what, yeah, you're uh, very that's welcome what I did, yeah, yeah, definitely. But Let me see if you can see my presentation, and now I'm going to enlarge it. Yes. Yes, I think you can. Yes. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Kirsten, for this. I think that picking up on what Kirsten was saying is absolutely, uh, is, is the guiding principle. So uh, these services are generating value only when and if they are uptaken by someone. And the purpose of uh, developing business models and in ultimate goal, developing a business model taxonomy, so a sort of generalizing what, uh, um, these climate services can provide to the community is precisely to capture how they can deliver this value and to whom. I'd like to show you, for example, an overview of what climate service landscape can look like. This is a very, uh, very kind of brief exercise done uh, by Italian Climate Tech, which is a network that is looking at the different climate tech startup in Italy only. It's not uh, fully representative and it's not exhaustive. It's just uh, a very big sample of, uh, of some of the players that are out there split in different sectors. Here you can see, I'm not sure you can see my, my, my um, indicator here, but at the very bottom, say, of bottom right corner of this picture, there's climate monitoring. And in climate monitoring, you recognize some, in a way, uh, suspects that are also coming from European projects, like uh, Safer Places, for example, here. But you don't have really like the big names that we're used to as academic community or a practitioner community, even though they're very active. This is because there is an heterogeneity per sector, per tool, target user, the business model used and the geographical scope. So sometimes these kind of mapping exercises are really not capturing what's happening on the ground. And mostly because they cannot recognize these services or tools as, as uh, potentially climate services. Taxonomies help doing exactly that, identifying who are the players to begin with, and then what are the key elements of success, but also the barriers that are preventing the success from happening. They're also very helpful for another purpose. Some of these, let's call it startups, but uh, some of these services are not for profit. So they would not fill in, in a way, by using a standard business model perspective. Instead, taxonomies are very, very useful precisely to help not-for-profit effort. For example, cities or municipalities or even uh, bigger donors such as the European Commission. We're taking in this project and in many other initiatives uh, two approaches. On the supply side, we're kind of defining how climate services are split and classified in the taxonomies by looking at the use they are having of inputs. So are they using data? Are they using information? Are they using knowledge? Uh, if they're using data, then they have a specific business model that normally kind of transforms raw information into post-process something. Uh, again, data sets. This is the case, for example, of the Copernicus Climate Change Service platform, but even the Copernicus landscape in general. Then we have the use of information, which is transforming uh, some kind of non-tailored information, more uh, user-oriented kind of still information, so not usable final end knowledge. And then the green layer instead is looking at how to really use knowledge into a more specific tailor-based and uh, user-based application. All these kind of distinctions have a business model, but also a pricing model. So they can be priced or they can be valued for profit or not. On the demand side, instead, we are testing now a concept at city level. So a not-for-profit kind of uh, level where we're trying to develop a business model around three major components. The first one is uh, data and tools. So they can be data, but also information and knowledge. Um, meaning that we want to promote an interoperability and usability as a concept. So once you collect this information, how can you use it? Communities of practice, so building knowledge, awareness, but also ability to use this information in the first place. And finally, to develop, whenever possible, a marketplace. I'm going to end in a second. We do it. Uh, by using the basic standard concept of a business model, that is basically understanding how, uh, what is the value behind what we're giving, may that be data, information, or knowledge, for whom, so the users, um, we want to characterize these users, we want to understand what their needs are, what their abilities are, what their kind of even time frame and geographical scope they're interested in. We want to understand what we need, 
to deliver that. So the key activities, the science that we need, do we need such a post-process project or is it just fine to handle, for example, data set that then we need to refine over time? And to deliver the key activities to a selected user, we need to develop a value network, which is precisely what we're doing here at the Work Cafe to the web uh, Finally, we need to understand how much all these activities cost. So we want to also understand how heavy are they. We do that through a review and a specific identification of taxonomies of business models at, in this case, but not limited to European case, uh, European level throughout the entire project. I end all over uh, and I'm very open to any questions. Thank you. Fantastic, Francesca. This was really nice and very informative. Ella. So I, I would invite the people from the audience, if you have a last specific question, then please raise your hand or put them into chat as you prefer. And I would like to start Ella, with one question for uh, Kirsten and then one question from Francesca. Ella, Kirsten, you have made the strong case for capturing all the benefits and all the values. I was just thinking about to what extent this, the, the value recognition uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that is provided by climate services should be driven by uh, climate justice principles and ethical consideration. So we can look outside and look what, what kind of benefits are delivered, but we should also start with what is a fair delivery, uh, what kind of benefits should be taken into account and so on. So would you have some thoughts on this uh, climate justice and the ethical principle in the value typology? Uh, thank you for that question, because uh, what I think is that first we are assessing the values. And then the next step is to show who's gaining uh, and who's losing and how is the ethical uh, questions, uh, as you are saying, represented in how values generate and how they are distributed. I can also tell that this is a very big issue in relation to implementation because I know many examples of adaptation projects that are extremely profitable in Denmark against uh, coastal flooding. They have not been able to be implemented yet because the municipality and the local house owners and other are still fighting about who should pay. And this is much, very much about who is gaining from this protection and what is the public good is that uh, sort of uh, nature and uh, to be able to use the beach and what about the summer house. So uh, I think there's a lot of issues and I would really like us to work with that because us uh, uh, climate services is not really helping to get solutions implemented. Fantastic, thank you. And Francesca, starting with the, the question that was posted in the chat in your last slide, you, you referred to we, uh, and uh, there's a question referring to whether you could elaborate a little bit on these, who are we? But adding to that, perhaps I would like to ask you, Allah. We have received a number of registration for this festival and altogether they are exceeding 450 people. But when you look across the different topics, Allah, um, so the business and innovation is a little bit underrepresented. We have a relatively low subscription rate. So what do you think, what should we do differently in order to tap into the business community that is benefiting from climate services? And I apologize for this, you know, very strategic question, but any thought on these would be welcome. Okay, I'll start with the easy one, uh, which is in this case, Paco's one. Uh, yes, you, you, you really spotted that every uh, question has a we. So uh, it's uh, true that uh, who are we? In this case, it's uh, the provider's point of view, uh, or not even the provider, but it could be um, even intermediary, but anyone who is kind of delivering these services. So it's more a supply uh, side kind of set of questions. We tested a more demand um, uh, side, demand side set of questions in another project, uh, Reach Out, which is the one that is actually presenting this afternoon, uh, where we can have a, a stronger discussion. But in this case, the business model is basically starting with imagine a group of scientists that got it together, they have a climate service where they have a tool that they want to promote and they want to understand 
what is the value that they are generating given the user that they want to target. So it's a ping pong thing, come and go. Uh, this business model thing could be uh, designed for every user segment, every user persona. So you could have 20 of it, not just one. Um, on the strategic point of view, I think, um, to be honest, when talking, for example, of people, uh, with people that are not really familiar with business concepts, for example, cities, I think that whenever we're calling it business model, there is a kind of resistance because a city doesn't necessarily understand the same concept of a standard, of a, of a sorry, startup or a private company. So we should probably find a way to call business model something that can be more familiar with people. It could be value model, it could be value delivery model, uh, but maybe the word business is a bit discouraging for some categories. Uh, while the private sector wants very specific answers. So I think it would be uh, a longer journey for us to make, to increase the awareness that not necessarily what we're producing is always responding to your back your question or to your specific need but it's a it's the value of co-production there and so it takes a bit longer fantastic thank you very much Ella and francesca uh there are a few more questions in the chat Ella, which we will take a little bit later Ella, i would like to hand over to the second panelist Ella, a round of panelists and Ella, that will be moderated by andreas andreas over to you Thank you, Yaro, again. And uh, yeah, we will now a little bit focus on the climate services market. And uh, uh, I would like to introduce uh, three speakers uh, that done this morning. So um, first of all, we have uh, Karen Morrissey um, with us, who is professor uh, in the Department of Technology Management and Economics uh, at the Danish uh, Technical University, the same university as Justin is affiliated with. Uh, Karen is uh, an economist and uh, as a background and is interested in uh, multidisciplinary uh, research, particularly in the application of spatial and regional analysis uh, to population health and uh, natural resource management. management. So welcome, uh, Karen. And from uh, LGI, our partner in France, uh, we uh, have two uh, people who joined us for this session. Um, first of all, Adiola. Uh, Jaliola uh, and uh, Imad Audi. Uh, Audi. I apologize if I don't spell it really correctly. Adiola uh, holds a master in management and technology and innovation from the Paris Saint Clair University uh, and joined LGI about three years ago, working on intervention uh, of European projects focusing on health and sustainable innovation. And uh, Imad holds a master in science and technology of the Ecole Polytechnique uh, in France and uh, uh, joined LGI uh, recently uh, as a sustainable innovation analysis. Uh, so welcome Adiola and Imad. And uh, I uh, would uh, suggest that uh, Karen uh, starts uh, with her uh, statement uh, first and then uh, followed up by uh, Adiola and Imad. So please. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to um, uh, chat today. I am just going to, I have one quick um, PowerPoint that doesn't seem to want to share with you guys. Um, if you bear with me, oh no. Perhaps it's telling me, asking me to open a uh, system settings. So perhaps we should go with some of the, the next presenter first and then come back to me. Okay. Um, otherwise, if it's the same diagram as you showed yesterday, I might dig it out. Um, if you hold me, give me a second. Yeah, I had slightly off updated it, but I okay, okay. So uh, then perhaps we we try uh, with uh, uh, Adiola and uh, Imad first. Mm -hmm. Okay, hello everyone. Let's try to share my screen.
Is it working? Just I need the feedback. OK, so uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, Andreas, for, uh, for giving me the floor. Uh, so maybe just to kind of complete a little bit, uh, a little bit um, I'm originally an engineer uh, interested in climate change. So I specialized uh, <clears throat> in a master at the Ecole Polytechnique in sustainable development. Um, and then I joined LGI, uh, which is a French uh, uh, Paris-based company, sustainable innovation company, who works on different uh, European projects um, and have experience in climate adaptation, resilience, and climate services. Uh, some projects, namely uh, Focus Africa, Marco, and others. So we will be uh, aiming to bring this experience and add as much value as possible to the Climate Europe 2 project. Um, I will be, uh, so uh, the time I, I have will be to discuss a little bit one aspect of this work package, which is market facilitation and brokerage. Um, so um, as uh, the previous speakers mentioned, the current market of climate services is still not very well understood or still fragmented and only partially available. So the goal um, of, uh, of this uh, aspect of the project will be to facilitate the market development and uptake of uh, climate services as well as share as much as possible knowledge among uh, market participants. Uh, so the following point is just a brainstorm of, uh, from our part at LGI of how we can proceed to facilitate uh, the market development. Of course, we still need to, um, to discuss uh, more thoroughly with uh, our partners and in order to shape a, a more precise um, uh, strategy. So, uh, but the idea is, of course, to first analyze the current market structure and trends, and also assess the gaps that are present in this market. Uh, from these gaps, we'll be able to understand the needs of providers and users um, in order to fill in these gaps. So after having a general understanding, we'll be uh, diving uh, more thoroughly into an analysis of the studies that we'll be identifying uh, during this project. And uh, from the analysis that we'll be having, we'll be identifying the gaps where, in the context of our project, Climate Europe 2 will be able to intervene and to propose direct solutions whether it be uh, networking solutions um, or others. And finally, we'll be uh, creating a dedicated knowledge brokerage services also uh, to be able to uh, better create this link between providers and uh, users. Um, so uh, this is a quick overview of what uh, the plan will will be for the next couple of uh, months and years. And uh, I give the floor to Karine now. Thank you very much. OK, thank, thank you. you, Imad, for the moment. And uh, Kanya, would you like to, to try again? Uh, otherwise, um, I'm, I'm... I just also sent a wonderful idea to send it to you, but I think I should be able to share now. Let's see if not. <clears throat> Who knows? Uh, PowerPoint? I think this is going to work. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, fine. The beauty of um, Zoom, uh, it always uploads the minute, it always does its updates the minute that you. Uh, you're trying to host something. So can everybody see my PowerPoint? No, no, you have stopped the sharing again. Oh. Yeah, should do it again and please then uh, use the presentation mode. Yeah. There we go. And there, are we good? Uh, no, that's the that's the presenter mode. Let's exchange that. Yeah, just do a quick 
Sorry, I'm working from two screens. Yeah, that's fine. Wonderful. Apologies for the delay. Hi, everyone. My name is Karen Morrissey. And as Andrea said, I'm in the same um, section, division and department as Kirsten. My background is I'm an economist. And um, that really informs actually um, how we're going to approach task uh, 4.1. Um, my main interest is climate change and um, human health, actually. So I will be under trying to understand how climate services in a perfect world, I'd like to understand how climate services can impact positively, hopefully, or at least mitigate the impact of climate change on human health. So in task 4.1, which I'm going to briefly speak about, we were tasked, DTU and Tatiana, Kirsten and I were tasked with um, setting up an inventory of climate service markets. As Kirsten has already said, as economists, we define um, markets from the user perspective. So um, something does not have value unless somebody needs it. Um, and in terms of developing this inventory, what we're hoping to do is develop it from a sectorial perspective, the, where the sector represent in this diagram represents the users, so uh, agricultural, potential agricultural users, um, potential mining users, potential manufacturing users, and what they're seeking to understand, which we hope to map is the climate change hazards or the opportunities available to their sector. So this is where the slight change was because when Andreas and Andreas and I spoke yesterday, I was only looking at hazards and Andreas pointed out that there can be opportunities. So for example, the sector will need to understand, agriculture would need to understand, for example, the impact of information in terms of drought, in um, which would have a negative impact, but actually for some areas, at least in the short term, it may be that Denmark is producing more strawberries, so there, there's a new product or new opportunities. Um, and at the end of the day, we would hope to um, highlight, to, with this mapping, we would hope to highlight what climate services, which is the last uh, box here, is required. So um, uh, what we see here and picking up on Francesca's point about business models, here we're looking, we would bring to the um, commercial or to the public sector, um, the set of information that will be required for each of um, for each of the different sectors, so that they will be able to align themselves. So, from maybe a commercial sector, somebody like Deloitte will be able to say, "We're going to focus on drought and agriculture sector because we have these problems, uh, these this data." However, something like a public sector organization that's interested in so societal opportunity, they might think, "Well, we need all of this kind of." data because we're interested in the wider good and need to understand the benefits from a wider perspective. So that's how we're going to, at the moment, we have proposed to map, uh, create an inventory of the climate service markets and looking forward to pot potentially discussing this in the breakout rooms. So thank you, Karen, for this uh, quick overview. Um, Mm, how uh, will you well uh, do this uh, inventory of of the market really practically? So how how we how do you intend to to do this? Uh, you say so we start with the sectoral approach, and um, um, but how you will assess what what's what's in there, what's already out there. Yeah, this is important. And I believe that Tatiana, who is the amazing postdoc that's on our project, is also online. So Tatiana, if I leave something out, please do join in. Um, and really, it should be Tatiana that's speaking about this. Um, what we're hoping to do is... Uh, if you notice from the presentation, I had a box in the middle that said evidence based. So as academics, one of the um, one of the skill sets that we can bring is to filter through the evidence. So we hope to understand for each sector uh, based on current documents, scientific uh, information, what sort of data 
for example, the agricultural sector would require and um, highlight this. And what the output would be, we believe that we have our ability to filter this information and understand uh, what's correct or not. Um, or where the greatest need is, we could put weightings. So for, for example, drought information is the most important for um, the ag sector. And then this inventory um, would be easily accept, uh, accessible to somebody like Deloitte or the, or the public sector where they're saying, yes, this, this, we have this data or we can start to develop this data and um, uh, it's the matching process. Um, Tatiana, have I done justice to the work that you're, we're, you're about to uh, undertake? Yes, I think you're perfect, Terry. Um, and Great. I can add something if you... I hope also that makes sense and nobody has ever called me perfect. You've made my day. <laughs> okay, thanks. Great. Thanks to also to Tatiana to step in. Um, yeah, further questions. Um otherwise I would uh um hand over back to, to Yarrow, uh, I think for the last part of this session here. Thank you very much, Andreas and Karin and Enima. Thank you for your interesting intervention. I have been monitoring the chat and there was one question that I would like to take and ask you, but also Kirsten or Francesca, if you would like to step in on those. And this is the public or private nature of climate services. And this is also perhaps related to why uh, the business community is uh, not so well connected to Climate Europe 2 project. So what are your thoughts on how to distinguish those climate services that should be part of uh, public goods and services, essential services delivered to the population and to the communities? What should be left to the commercial sector to step into and, uh, and develop their businesses in? I'd like to comment on that. I think that uh, actually all that needs to be a very careful documentation of that the climate services that are used, if it is like climate data, or economic data, whatever, how this is related to the state of the art in science. And then of course, and, and I think it's a big problem nowadays, if we go into this, uh, some of these uh, companies, like uh, I can mention, like some of these, like Price Waterhouse, whatever, I went into their homepage because I think it's very interesting to have a climate service uh, company, but you cannot see how that data is related to science. So, what I think is that uh, we need to find out how, how, uh, how this can really work. And I hope Francesca has a good answer on that because when I talk to consultancy companies, they say to me that they cannot earn money on just displaying everything open all the time. And on the other hand, they don't have time to follow all our scientific meetings. So it's not very nice to work in such a, a, a company, I think. So it would be very nice uh, if they could have opportunities to follow the scientific community. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Mm -hmm. Francesca, la, la, if you give me a second, I see Miko has raised his hand and he would like to come in. So you might still think about your answer today. Miko, yeah, well, I think... and thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, I can just give a good example. So I come from a Finnish Metrological Institute. And so over 20 years ago that we, for example, developed with the um, food distribution, so with supermarket uh, chains, a, a, a kind of climate dependent service. And here we have the problem that if it's all kind of the methodology was freely uh, uh, kind of openly made so it could be shared, the data was not something that we only had. The end result was that when we have made a successful service, the, the customer just bought it from a cheaper source. So another one to do exactly the same for them. And we were out of the loop. So I think this is very good to understand that, of course, um, like if, if we want to have um, private businesses uh, uh, in the loop, 
we somehow have to be able to give them kind of like a, a when you have developed something, you also have the opportunity to kind of make money on it. And, and that that is not so simple to combine with everything's public, everything's open. So that's why I think there's there's a difficulty in, in a principal way uh, what to, to do. That's why I do think that lots of this stuff is good to do in a public kind of way, but maybe some of the technical solutions of how they can be done that is probably then something where where it is still a area where we can leave it to to someone trying to do privately something. Fantastic! Thank you very much, Miko. I remind everybody that Miko is organizing a side event this afternoon that will start at a quarter past at three o'clock, and this is going to focus on the Ishe project. So thank you, Miko, also for your intervention here. Francesca, what is your thought, if any, on on this matter? I see zero competition between the private and the public, to be honest. I just see gains of both sides. I think what we need as public sector is precisely an overview of what clients and users may need. And the private sector is in a very good position to do, to do that because consulting have that business model, go out, find clients, respond to clients' needs with level of details that often are not there, they're lacking. And that's where the public and universities and research center, uh, technological efforts, innovation in the methods, I'm thinking about every everything that has to do with deep learning, everything that has to do with satellite data and doesn't come from the private sector. It comes from the, from the public sector, from universities, publishing papers that then eventually are uptaking there. So in a way, the private sector can be our entry point, our gateway to these user needs. And so it's kind of surveillance of what is up there, which is something that we can not really do. That's what Kirsten was saying. It, she cannot keep up with scientific meetings as all of us, imagine if we need to add like uh, meetings with every different client. So we can have this gate point, but our job is also to improve what is out there and also to prove that there are benefits in this interaction. Um, so in a way, I just see that cooperation by setting boundaries that are pretty clear on one hand can be very beneficial. And we don't do that. We don't extract the benefits that we generate as public sector ever. And that's where we should potentially need to learn. But um, I would not compete with the private sector at all. I would just work with them. Fantastic, excellent. I see a comment from Romy in the chat. Romy, if you feel like uh, unmuting your microphone and uh, commenting on yeah. what has been said so far. Thank you. Yeah, well, it, it, I think Francesca is um, told to see exact same thing as what I mean. It's um, cooperating together, which is the greatest opportunity here. And we um, have a, quite a big network of institutional uh, investors, and we were a bit frightened to ask them for money or contributions in terms of collecting and uh, making data available because we felt like they would say something like, why should I now contribute money in a project that later will become available publicly for everyone? Why should I do it? But if you tell them what the greater picture is, so that if you start now, then a small ball will roll and become a way bigger pro uh, project, then people are actually quite interested in, in contributing after all. But that really depends on who you ask. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and, uh, and uh, for contributing to this discussion. I would like to ask Demetrio. Demetrio, you have posted a very interesting question, which uh, motivated me to ask this uh, to, the, to the audience. Uh, would you want to uh, follow up on what has been said or uh, give it a different angle? Good morning to everybody. Um, so far, thank you for the insightful comments and all have been said uh, yeah i just i just pose a question i have a different angle because of my my previous experience i was working uh for um providing indicators and strategic insight to the city for the uh development in terms of well-being and sustainability it was quite a large 
framework and in there we we try to build uh, also some some firms and business on that uh, but the truth was that uh, in, in that case, uh, whatever we did uh, was uh, a sort of public good. So we provided that information and then were used by, by the other people. And there was no way to protect this value, to price this, uh, uh, this value. And this was for us an enormous challenge that, that somehow impeded us to create a business on that. And of course, the value was still, uh, still created, but under other other forms. So uh, my question was about this, how climate service can in fact be uh, different. Uh, I can see from the comments that uh, whenever there is um, a high knowledge, we arrive um, to the consultancy level, then of course it can be protected, but to which extent this, this can be sufficient or what can be, can be done? Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dimitriola. I think we will take that question to the second part of our discussion. We have only three minutes left and I would still like to invite the, the, another colleague, the, Adam Jablonski, who is the assistant professor at the uh, WSB University in Boston. And the, the, Adam, we will have only three minutes. Do you think you, you could the, give us your view on the business model for uh, digital transformation and your experience. Hello, everyone. Is presentation my in? It, we see it, but not in the pr full presentation mode. Hey, you you have my presentation. I, we see the screen with your presentation, but not in presentation mode. So we see also the slide on the left side, uh, the overview and so on. But please go on. I mean, it uh, it doesn't matter. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I will argue you, uh, you present my experience according to concept of uh, business models. Uh, in my opinion, concept of business models uh, create new opportunities uh, to um, climate changing. And in this topic, um, we, in my opinion, have to analyze social effect and economical effect with using of new economy, um, with uh, analyzing why digital transformation and climate transformation create new business models in special sectors. It is very difficult situation that we are looking for new competitive advantage, new competitive advantage with using new services, new services. Uh, this time, um, a lot of enterprises are looking for uh, opportunity to create new benefits benefits with uh, um, obtaining um, reasonable profit. In this concept, this reasonable profit uh, is um, created by using of a new proposal of value for the customers and also a new logic of uh, turnover. In this topic, we analyze why, for example, artificial intelligence uh, create new opportunities to uh, build a new configuration of business models and new value, digital value. Now we have a situation that we uh, have uh, two alternative worlds. One, it's an analog system, ecosystem, and second is a digital ecosystem. We have uh, users, we have uh, citizens, and we have uh, netizens. In this topic, we analyze why we can uh, um, uh, build new opportunity to uh, create a new proposal um, value for the for the uh, customers. In this topic, we um, uh, anal we should be uh, have why we uh, uh, um, should be concentrate on new opportunity of business. And for example. Um, um, constructive con uh, confrontation between sharing economy uh, with a digital economy uh, define new products, for example, digital products with using of uh, digital platforms. And in this topic is a new stream of new products, new services, which um, uh, fulfill criteria of 
uh, positive impact of climate change. It is for me very important that I analyze why uh, new economies um, uh, uh, change uh, construction of business models. Adam, thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, virtual breakout room on business and market. Uh, we will wait uh, uh, 30 seconds for everybody to join us. And then we will start with a short summary of what has been discussed so far. And then uh, we will invite our distinguished panelists to join the floor and uh, share their thoughts on what needs to be done on these two important topics. Fantastic. My name is Yara Misiak and I'm working at Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change and leading the work stream on uh, business innovation. And my co-moderator is uh, Andreas. Andreas, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Yaro, and welcome everybody also to the second uh, breakout group uh, on business and market. And uh, I think we already had a very expiring uh, first uh, round of discussions uh, in this group uh, on uh, business innovation, on the market development, on various aspects uh, of uh, the, this topic that we are touching on uh, in, in this session. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, I, I hope that this will continue uh, with the new audience uh, that we will have here uh, during the next hour. Thank you very much, Ella, Andreas. So let me just summarize what we have been discussing so far in terms of Ella, business innovation. And then I hand over to Andreas for a short summary on the market. Um, so Climate Europe to, uh, sets out to develop a typology of different benefits obtained from climate services and then explore the taxonomy of sustainable business model innovation. We will be hearing uh, again about uh, what it means and what we are doing in the project and how the typology of benefits and the taxonomy of business strategies will be developed and what they contain. We had an, uh, a brilliant discussion in the first half uh, that was focused on to what extent climate services uh, should be considered as a public good and delivered by, uh, by public uh, organizations and uh, from which point onwards uh, the, uh, the climate services become a private benefit and uh, should be encouraged by using, by using uh, commercial or commercially delivered climate services. That was one interesting topic to look into. Then we looked into uh, the divergence of the views, uh, why the topic, uh, when we call it business innovation with climate services, why it doesn't fly or it doesn't resonate with the audience. And we said uh, the, uh, for the climate scientist and for previous, the business thinking behind the services is not as strong as it is uh, to a large extent. Uh, the, the market is developing by, uh, by supply uh, driven approaches. Uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, climate information and we realize their potential but uh, apparently there are some uh, some barriers that prevent the user from recognizing uh, the wealth of possibilities. It might be uh, a question of the language as well. On the other hand, the, the business uh, entities that uh, are familiar with business model strategies, they might uh, uh, be less, uh, felt less approached by calling it climate services because uh, what they are delivering is a, a, a compact a policy or decision advice for specific purposes. And the climate side of this is one of many other aspects. Uh, so it also includes uh, knowing the vulnerabilities, knowing 
um, uh, the innovation strategy of the business entities and so on. So it seems that we are in the middle between two words. So on the one hand, the business is not understood. And on the other hand, the climate might not speak to the uh, to the business entities. This was be my short summary of our discussion. And this is also the teaser for continuing in this. And uh, I'm looking forward to Andreas, your summary of the uh, discussion so far on the policy side. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, uh, yeah, with the, in our session, we are also looking into the developing landscape of climate services as in the public as well as in the private sector. And just to follow up on uh, what Yaros just said, I had recently a, uh, somebody from a, a private climate service, and he told me, well, in in the private sector, the the expression climate service is not even used, uh, and so they have a different different uh, perspective on that. Uh, and uh, working somehow differently. And I think if we really want to um, touch on the whole climate service market within Climate Europe too, we have to uh, really reach out uh, to this part. Uh, and this is a really fast emerging field of climate services. I still call it them climate services. Um, and we have to understand how they, they work, how, they, how we can get better incorporate them uh, to really um, come, get, come forward with uh, our uh, goals to uh, develop uh, climate services for uh, the users in a way that they get the best quality uh, information uh, that they, uh, they need for answering their uh, urgent questions. Um, and I think we will, uh, re during the repeat of this session, uh, again, uh, have a view on uh, the approaches we'd like to um, follow up uh, to do this. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. So before inviting again our distinguished panelists to share their views and explain uh, uh, what we are working on and what might be of interest of the audience, and I would like to remind us, uh, Allah, you might Allah, kindly introduce yourself in the chat, putting your name, your organization, and Allah, perhaps why you are interested in this topic on what, or what the, what the Allah, expected outcomes of this discussion of, or, or of this project might be. So please feel free to put it in the chat. We will Allah, take Allah, screen your messages and Allah, we will pick up the question for the audience. But you are also very welcome to raise your hand if you would like to step into the discussion and uh, provide your view or perspective. So without any further ado, I would like to invite Professor Kirsten uh, Halsnes from the Danish Technical University of Copenhagen to share her view on the value uh, and value benefits. Just to introduce Kirsten is a professor for climate economics and risk management. And she's IPCC uh, author and uh, contributed a number of international studies on sustainable development. And our second panelist uh, for the business innovation part will be Francesca La Rosa, who is working at uh, the Royal Institute of Technology in uh, Stockholm, KTH. And previously she worked at the University College of London and also Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change. So Kirsten and uh, um, Francesca, if you would like to um, open your la, open your video camera and mm -hmm. uh, yeah yep yep but Thank i cannot you. share my screen now the picture just changed so uh, could you please see. try again uh, yeah i'll try again this. now yeah so we'll oh, first okay. start with kirsten and uh, then we go to francesca so you see my screen and uh, i'd like to we see the screen. If you launch the presentation, it will be perfect. But you don't see it now. I don't see it now. No, I see end of slideshow, click to exit. Uh, okay, fantastic. Yeah, okay, that's better than nothing. So now it's working. Now yeah, it's yeah. Perfect. Right. Thank you, Yaro, for introducing me and uh, 
I'm really glad to participate here also because uh, we actually had a very interesting discussion in, in the first round here. So, um, and, and I hope I can do my presentation in a sharper way because now I know more about the touchy issues. And before I move further, I'd like to uh, say that uh, in DTU, we are three persons working together on this. We are Professor Karen uh, Morrissey and uh, our postdoc, Tatiana Ferraro. And uh, we are a team working on this together. And uh, you will hear a presentation from Karen a little bit later. So uh, when we are talking about what are the values of using climate services, I would like to do it in a concrete way where I try to take the starting point in uh, what could happen in terms of risks of different uh, climate disasters. In order to show how many different sorts of values you could really protect. And if you can protect these values, it has a very big benefit to use a climate service. So if we start in the left uh, top corner of my slide, you can see a flooding map of buildings and roads in a Danish city called Odense, where the fairy tale you all know, Hans Christian Andersen, uh, grew up. So if we have high quality climate service information, we will know where coastal flooding could come, how high the water would be, how often it would return, but also what would be effective. So it's a very big value in adaptation planning that you know actually where you should do something. Then if you look at the bottom uh, middle um, map, you can see nature conservation areas and also. So this is about biodiversity, it's about the ecosystems and the, and the life in nature. And we would also like to protect that because it has a very high value to us. So this is another part of the climate service uh, values. And then in the top right corner, I think you have something that I think is interesting. This is a map of Copenhagen city, where they have counted how many pedestrians that stay in a given area. And the logic is that if a pedestrian wants to pass an area with a mark with a green, it has a value to be there. And with the red dots, they even stay in the area. So if this area was flooded or something else would happen there, it would uh, really be a benefit to know it because you know that if you uh, invested in some adaptation by using uh, climate services, you can avoid that these uh, pedestrians are disturbed in what they really value because the logic of economics is what you do is what you value. And then uh, just Briefly to go into what we are planning to do. Uh, and this, uh, the first uh, thing is, is that we will do a scoping review, looking at the literature about how have climate service values been addressed. And this is something that uh, Tatiana and Karen are working on very consistently together with Yaro, who has a lot of ideas about reviews. So uh, this is a good collaboration. Then we are also happy uh, to have a dialogue with you at the festival and other users of climate services. What would you like to get out of using uh, climate services? Have you good and bad experience on getting climate services on, uh, previously? And the business partner, it showed up to be a very big uh, discussion topic about public-private business uh, in our previous session, so that's great. And then we would like to do some in-depth case studies with users of climate services. And what we are looking for is the bad cases and the good cases. So we also want to know where it went wrong and potential users were not happy with what they got. And then finally, I would like to, to say that in the spirit of the EU roadmap for climate services, that I think is our basis. The value of climate services really depend on if the climate service is uptake, uptaken and if it creates 
a value in terms of um, reducing climate risks. And it's very important as I'm illustrating with the handshake, supply and demand need to meet, need to go together. That's where change is happening. And that is what we should try to aim at. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Kirsten. And before Le turning to the audience with the questions, Le, uh, I would invite Francesca to share your view on what we are doing and Le, how the community could be engaged and Le, uh, what could be done on the side of business innovation. Over to you, Francesca. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I was planning to see if there is a way I can show you an example of more user-driven uh, business model. We also see model. the slide which says at the end of slideshow. Click, but it's not mine. I think. Okay, <laughs> so you need to share your screen. Okay. Um, so let me check. Because in the previous section, as uh, you know, there was a quite a lively discussion about private public nature and so on. And I, I got that, uh, of course, there is, a, there is interest in understanding what a more demand uh, driven kind of business model uh, looks like. So let me share it. Can you see my screen? We do. Yes, yeah. thank you. Okay. We were talking about what business model mean. And so we were having this overview of a very specific landscape, which is the Italian one. And uh, in the previous sector, we, note, we noticed that basically there is a wide heterogeneity of both users and providers, which make it difficult to understand uh, what is the value that uh, every given provider uh, gives and what is the user value that every user value. Have. So taxonomies would help in this, and that's the purpose of our uh, task in the work uh, package too. Uh, on the supply side, uh, we saw in the previous uh, section, uh, but um, just uh, to be a bit clearer, we were kind of div dividing the different services according to the input that they use. There are many different ways you can actually have a taxonomies of services, it's just one proposal doesn't necessarily mean that uh, then it's going to be the final one that's the purpose of the entire process on the project so we're not kind of providing uh, final solutions here but just proposal and on the demand side the idea is to really get uh, what are the different components that a user would need to kind of develop any further is knowledge and understanding of climate services. And here it's an example from city hubs, which uh, basically are not for profit entities, of course, cities, uh, but they're also very much managed uh, by a series of political, social, and economic considerations that need to enter. So not just climate services. This was a very uh, useful example from a supply side uh, approach where the we that you see here is providers. So basically what we're asking providers every time is how do we are, how do, are, how are they planning to deliver value for whom, with what, and making sure that they use external and internal value network. Then finally, they need to price this activity and so to basically, to basically uh, give a sort of estimate in a way. This is an example of what the city hub business model, so this one, would look like for a city. So we asked basically sort of the same question of the business model type that you saw before, but from a user perspective. So we were asking them, which problem are you facing? Which problems are you thinking you should improve? Which decision would you be willing to support? Or which uh, uh, external partners and stakeholders are you planning to expand? And we derived certain climate impacts, so certain needs that these users may have and what they have on every different categories, the data and tools, the communities of practice, the marketplace. The reason why we're not splitting in sectors is because otherwise we don't have a taxonomy at the end of the day. 
Uh, but what we want is a framework that we can use for a bunch of different sectors, a bunch of different users, a bunch of different needs in a way that uh, can be useful for private and the public entities. Again, this is just an example, uh, but it's something that we may potentially discuss even further in the afternoon session. I'll close here. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. For, uh... And as we are waiting for more questions from the audience, and please, whoever would like to ask question, please raise your hand as well, in addition to posting your question in the chat. Um, I, was, I was thinking on um, what is your view on uh, approaching the climate services and the benefits obtained from them slightly differently, right? In the, this afternoon, we will have a presentation of a Reach Out project that is developing uh, city hubs and, uh, and climate narratives. And the climate narratives is something which is easily understood uh, by the citizen, by the businesses. It translates the city vision into something which is uh, explaining what might happen as a result of climate change, but also what are the impact of climate variability under the current climate and, uh, and how to how, how everybody could contribute to building a more sustainable future. So just the, the, my question is to both of you and in these terms, so should we start thinking in different terms, uh, saying uh, climate storylines, climate narratives that uh, pick up on the specific reasons why we are using the climate services and the benefits for the intended audience? Would that be helpful? And I start with Kirsten, what do you think? Yeah, but I would say, yeah, no, this is exactly how we work with it. Because I think the starting point is that uh, some area, uh, it could be a city, but it could also be business, whatever, is getting a concrete sort of description of what the risks are and what could happen in the future. And what we do then is to link it to their own plans, because then we are taking a digital uh, local plants and uh, linking them to where climate events could happen. And then there's a broader dis dis discussion about if we want to develop our city in a way where we have nice things in the harbor and green areas, the tourists coming, how could uh, climate risk management and adaptation be integrated in that? So we take a broader perspective than just climate. We take a development perspective. And I would also do that for business and, and for the tourist sector. Because then what you're doing is that you are actually not only talking to the climate people in the in the business, you are talking to uh, the directors and to the mayor. Brilliant. Thank you. Francesca, what is your take on this? Well, in my case, I would say the storylines really help. But I think that what we need at this point is rather more a business model logic than a storyline. Like uh, my starting point would be really to use this kind of frameworks precisely to understand what the different values are and how are we planning to deliver or achieving, meaning also pricing, for example. Then the storyline can help moving the business model along over time. So you just don't fix on a sort of snapshot, but you have a more kind of evolving landscape but uh, I think it's an easy is an easy is an easy answer for me say so brilliant thank you uh, just to remind us uh, this week there was uh, the release of the synthesis report of assessment uh, uh, IPCC assessment report six and uh, it, it goes into the direction of moving away from the synthesis of of climate knowledge into interpreting what this knowledge might mean for different people. I think there are a number of things that we could learn, we could learn from it. I, I, I have seen Marina's comment in the chat. Marina, uh, do you think you could step in and explain a little bit uh, your, your question in a short term? Yeah, sorry. And I cannot turn on my camera right now, but like I just wanted to um, it was a comment related to what I was hearing at the beginning about the summary of the former question, and it sort of relates also now to thinking about, you know, whether, how and whether, like, we can think about climate services as having, as centering climate or or not, you know, uh, and that's related to what Kirsten was saying, and 
Uh, and again, I, I'm an academic, so uh, excuse me for coming to this with a very academic perspective, but uh, in, in, in some of the literature, what, what the way that sometimes we can think about sort of decision making about climate that doesn't necessarily center climate, it was, is with these sort of bottom up approaches to decision making, where basically instead of going from this predict and act approach, where you like look at what the climate would look like in the future and then you make a decision based on that you you think about what the community or like whatever level of governance that you're you're thinking about what the goals are and then think about how you can integrate um whether whether it is a priority or whether it poses some risks the climate component into your decision making and i was wondering whether that could like maybe help bridge this sort of i i thought i I, I was I was uh, understanding that there is a bit of a gap between like these public climate services where like this climate data is really at the center and maybe the private ones where you know the 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 consulting in, in incorporates climate into uh into the decision making but like it, into this broader decision making and I I was just wondering whether this uh this this way of thinking about it might help you know maybe uh, uh think about how to bridge this uh, and whether, you know, I'm I'm coming from a work package one perspective. So thinking about whether this can have some some lessons about best practices, about how we think about producing information that is relevant, whether there is anything that might be relevant to thinking about procedural standards, you know, about how we how we think about integrating climate information into decision making. Uh, sorry, and that was a bit long-winded. Sorry. Thank you, Marina. That was very good. I think it's a good transition to to Andrea. So I think the, what you are touching upon is also how the climate services are co-designed and co-developed from bottom up, and to, uh, how to make them work uh, for the specific people. So, Andrea, by passing to you the floor, and uh, uh, looking forward to listening on the market side, uh, do you think you could elaborate a little bit on on this co-development? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. This is uh, really a, a good starting point. And uh, there are two things. One uh, slide that uh, Francesca put up with the, with this uh, very complicated landscape of uh, the Italian uh, part of the of the market, which already illustrates quite, quite nicely how complicated and widespread uh, climate service climate services market is, markets are uh, across uh, across Europe Europe and beyond and uh, same uh, is of course valid to the uh, if we go from pro the provider to the to the user side so this is uh, a, a very complex um uh, the uh, market that developed over the past decade or so, as uh, we heard yesterday and uh, in the introduction as well. And uh, so we we would like to um, do within uh, Climate Europe too, also an inventory of the the market and see uh, what where are the gaps, where where are the uh, uh, possible paths pathways for future developments and. Um, we would like to uh, learn about good practices, best practices to to really um, see which kind of procedures provide uh, the most value to the uh, to the customers to to our users of the information that we have in hand from the academic side or from, yeah from the from the scientific side, um, and uh, this will uh, if we improve our services um, i think um, provide more trust and transparency for the users and this uh, trust issue that uh, was picked up yesterday uh, in the introductory session as well is a very important one uh, that we reach out to our users that we are jointly co-developing uh, services with our users to improve this uh, the, the quality of our products but also improve trust and transparency uh, of uh, of climate services uh, and so uh, in this work package for on market um development we are um, uh, reaching out to to uh, all this to the market itself but also to the uh, to the uh, quality high quality elements of uh, the market uh, and uh, also to emerging fields of uh, the climate service market, how the uh, are they developing? And it's just, it's just 
a close interaction with uh, also with the with the business innovation that we just heard about and also with the standardization as marina just pointed out uh with because at the end in climate europe 2 we are aiming for uh, uh standardized uh climate services or standardization of climate climate services certification of um uh, climate service products um, that will help users as well uh, as providers to improve their products, the use of the products, and to uh, make the most uh, best um, impact out of uh, what we can provide as in, in terms of climate information. So this perhaps as a uh, introduction to, to, to this part, and we have two panelists here for you as well. Um, and I would like to introduce briefly uh, Karen Morrissey, uh, who's professor in the Department of Technology Management and Economics at the uh, DTU of the Danish Technical University, same department as Kirsten is, and uh, Kirsten already uh, briefly said that Karen uh, is uh, working also in the, in the Climate Bureau too here is an economist uh, by uh, ba background and in uh, interested in multidisciplinary uh, research in particular applications to spatial and regional analysis to public uh, population, sorry, population health and uh, natural resource management. So welcome uh, Karen and uh, uh, second panelist will be Imad Audi from uh, uh, LGI in France, uh, which is a partner here in uh, Climate Europe too. And uh, um, Imad is uh, has a master in science uh, and technology of the Ecole Polytechnique in uh, France, and uh, joined uh, recently LGI as a uh, sustainable innovation analysis. He intervenes uh, in European and business to business projects um, uh, on uh, sustainable um, innovation and, and market assessment. Uh, so these two uh, people will give you a very brief insight into the work we are doing uh, within the, the um, uh, climate service market development uh, part of the European 2 project. So Karen, would you please start? Happy to. Thank you for the introduction, Andreas. And I think I should be able to... Uh, Zoom did a hard reset on me during uh, during the breaks, but I guess at least it uh, waited for the break. Uh, let me see. Here we go. And what can you guys see now? Um, you have to uh, enable the uh, the full. Uh, mm. the full screen but yeah this this one yeah then uh, that'll be fine thank you great wonderful thank you so much so uh, good afternoon everyone i'm going to briefly introduce what um tatiana kirsten and i are hoping to achieve in um task 4.4.1 uh, which is in a nutshell to present an inventory of climate service uh, uh, markets, uh, climate services, I would say for the market. And I'm really enjoying the conversation around the public and private. And I've added some comments to the chat, bo uh, chat box and I'm hoping to discuss them later. But I would see as a baseline uh, that this inventory, as you can see, I have co uh, commercial and societal opportunities that what we present here will be applicable to both. Um, so what we're hoping to do as economists, as Kirsten said, we are very much interested in defining uh, climate services from the perspective of the user because climate services are only required or only have value if they're used. Um, and what we're hoping to do in terms of developing this inventory is look at it from a sectorial point of view, where we would look at each of the sectors, for example, at a very high level, look at agriculture, look at mining, look at manufacturing, and try to map out 
what are the necessary um, climate change hazards or climate change opportunities, as Andreas kindly pointed out to me uh, yesterday, that these sectors are going to be uh, facing in the next few years. And I also want to say, I didn't say this before, that I think it will be interesting to divide the climate change hazards opportunities in terms of the in inventory into short, medium and long term because they are going to change. We might see look, we're might see some opportunities for uh, in the short term, but we all know climate change has no good outcome. And what this will do is provide public sectors or commercial in entities that could, that have this information, have climate service information, with the capacity to understand where they should focus their um, their energies um, should. So if it was a commercial in entity, something like Deloitte, they might see that, oh, we have really great drought information. We sh uh, the ag sector needs this. This is where we should put our um, um, this is where we should put our um, our energies. However, my feeling is for the public sector and as a public public or welfare economist, the societal or the public sector, the inventory will be overall of benefit because the public sector will want to cover um, all, uh, all eventualities. So just to pick up on a question that was asked, how do we define the climate change hazards or opportunities? So what Tatiana and I and Kirsten are going to do is go to the literature and, um, and including great documents or um, to understand what will be the emerging threats for each of these sectors. So this, uh, this is where the science comes in, where we will develop a science-based um, inventory, which will hopefully bring the sector needs together with the um, opportunities or needs of the public and commercial sector. And I hope that captures what um, I'm trying to say. Tatiana, anything to add? No, okay. Krista, no, Karen, for now, I think it's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So Karen, thanks very much for this brief overview. And uh, then I would uh, then just ask Imart to uh, give a perspective from the LGI side of uh, art, please, Imart. Of course. Um, one moment. So, um, hello everyone. Um, I'm Imad. Um, I'm a consultant at LGI Sustainable Innovation. And uh, in the context of uh, today's uh, event, I will be presenting a quick overview of one of the aspects of the work that we are doing in Climate Europe 2, which is the market facilitation and brokerage. So as uh, previous speakers uh, mentioned, the current market of climate services is still a little bit fragmented and only partially available. So what we'll try to do is to facilitate the market development and uptake of uh, these services, as well as share knowledge uh, among the participants uh, of the market. So uh, providers and users. In a more specific way, we will uh, analyze First, the market structures and trends, as well as assess the market gaps and needs. We'll do so in order to bring support in um, uh, long-term uh, business uh, model uh, of, uh, of climate services and the market. We will uh, be analyzing also studies that were identified or that will be identified during uh, this project based on this analysis uh, of this deep analysis of the case study we will be able to intervene and propose solutions to uh, identified gaps uh, of course uh, in the context of the climate group 2 project and uh, as a last idea we will 
creating dedicated knowledge brokerage service uh, in order to create this link and uh, fortify this link between providers and users. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, short view. Uh, you have already an idea which part of the market are you will specifically touch on, or if you will, you just go just uh, across all market segments, or if you have any um, ideas on that? Uh, it will probably. Uh, I mean, you will probably touch. Uh, different aspects of the market. We still uh, haven't really decided or we still haven't, I mean, we're still at an early stage. We still need to um, conduct more discussion with partners and um, in order to get a clearer idea of exactly what, uh, what are the market needs and where we can uh, bring our support and, uh, and intervene uh, in the most efficient uh, way. So thank you very much. And uh, any other questions we have to hear from the floor in the moment? Yeah, Jaro. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity and uh, for your in interesting talks. I was just thinking about, you know, the uh, uh, climate services market is ill-defined, although we are still a little bit struggling how to confine it. So there are segments of that market, for example, for the financial risk uh, from climate change. Uh, so there's a specific needs for elaborating on that. Uh, so there might be also specific needs on sustainable finance. But in many other areas, uh, the market is a little bit fluid. It's uh, like ill-defined uh, when we, it's not easy to say where we start from. And on the way of uh, mapping the market, well, we will be driven uh, into different directions. And the policy uh, landscape is changing as well. There are new incentives for using the climate cases. So I was just wondering, Imad or Karin or Andreas, uh, would how we could address this dynamically evolving uh, uh, landscape of climate services across, across Europe or elsewhere? Um, oh, well, it'll keep us in uh, jobs for the next few years because they're going to have to have a climate Europe three, right? I think this is um, my perspective and I do a lot of adaptive climate change and I'm a, I'm a really big fan of not setting things in stone. And I think that's what we will have to do with climate services and the concepts that we're developing here, that these are the state of the art for this time. And we see with all the major standardization tools in Europe, like the NACE sector, all of these, they're regularly updated every 10 years. So I think what's important here that Climate Europe 2 is developing a tool that's the state of the art now and is usable now, but that we already put in place the capacity so that it can be updated because it's the it's the it's what has always made these kind of tools difficult to actually use over time is the fact that they weren't built with the idea of adaptability in them. And actually, hopefully we've learned our lessons and understood that um, actually from day dot, yeah, it is a standardization, it is a typology, it is a taxonomy, but it's one that will be fluid over time. Brilliant. Thank you, Karin. I see Tatiana raised her hand and uh, welcome to this group and please. Uh... Hi. <laughs> I would just to add uh, from this, sorry, I'm going to move to the other screen here. Well, just to add for this question, uh, it's very important because the market is very different. The, uh, but, but the thing is, we can point with this overview of the market exactly this, that uh, the, the climate service should be at, uh, uh, should look at the local specific uh, needs. You know, like uh, they, uh, for example, if you look from the agriculture sector, they can change a lot the the needs that they uh, from the from the information, and also the climate service can um, 
can see this opportunity and building more tailored communication with different landscapes, geography, and uh, and so on. You know, so this is a thing. Uh, it's also again on this overview of the market. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have spotted in the chat an interesting discussion, and I was wondering whether Nevers, you would like to step in and ask your question online. Hello, everyone. Yes, I think that it's um, it's just a question that I have with regard to the to the to the market needs, because I think that sometimes, from my personal perspective and experience, sometimes the users don't know that they have a need. Um, so, so the question is how to visualize and um, create somehow that need uh, uh, in, in, in this landscape of climate service. How can we, because if we want really um, um, upscale climate services, uh, uh, we need to, to understand the market as an evolving market and, and, and how we can also, uh, let's say, um, uh, make an effort on that evolution of the market on the use of innovative climate services. That is somehow my question. Fantastic. Who would like to take uh, that question? La Kirsten, Karin, Andres. I can say something because what I think is that uh, this also goes back to what we talked about with storylines, because if you can show through storylines that there is a risk in a place, and this risk could be reduced if you use climate services. It's also a way to get into that. And uh, I think you are right that in many cases, the users are not really knowing that they could really get something out of using that. And, uh, and this is something we have to verify. So, uh, and this is also how I read this um, task 3.1, that we should verify that we can create values. That's important. I indeed, I very much agree with you, but uh, as the example show by you on which are the added value, uh, do you think that we need more examples on different sectors, different uh, uh, areas on how we can add and identify the added value of climate services on that. Yeah, in, in a way, I think, yeah. But I also think that uh, we already know from many studies that uh, different areas in Europe and other places could really have a high risk. So we can also draw on existing studies that are really mapping all the vulnerable areas. Because if you know what the vulnerable areas are, you can also uh, see what it could pay off. But I will also say that and this is a conclusion from previous projects, that the legislation and mandatory planning is also important. So if it is mandatory to make, like in the financial sector, climate uh, risk stress test, <laughs> if this is mandatory and it is, it really makes these uh, financial institutions wake up. And they are demanding climate services already now. I would like, as a moderator, to step in and then I pass the floor to Andres. I think from my personal experience in working on with and on climate services, I would almost, you know, the climate services, the end product, right? It's, that is eventually delivered. I would almost call this area climate coaching um, or, or, or something similar because the value is identified through the dialogues and collaboration between those that understand the climate information and can manipulate that information and those that really need that knowledge. So it's really a, something a mutually beneficial scoping process that eventually will, uh, demonstrate that there is a value of changing the current practices by relying on better knowledge. But uh, Andreas and then Karin. Yeah, thanks very, thanks very much. And uh, I think reaching out to the uh, to the users, users community, making them aware of what uh, what benefits they might have, is still an issue. We know, we as uh, um, Kirsten just said, we as the academic community, we know a lot, 
but those people out there not even know what we know or nor they don't know what what kind of benefit they could have by using that information and uh, if we want to develop a market we have to reach out to the to the users uh, user community and to convince them or show them um, what benefit uh, they could have what value a climate service can have of course if you have a kind of mandatory thing uh say eu taxonomy on something that uh, companies have to have to apply uh then uh everything works fine so they're looking around for getting that what they need but uh, there are so many parts and fields and in, in, in climate services where we could really uh reach out better to the um to the users and we have to think about how do, how we best improve not only say the co-production process uh, itself but um to really uh to, to for the start to to get uh, in touch with uh, the users community wonderful Kelly. um so hi thanks for that um I um in terms of climate services and their value for me I don't see any this is the prelude to what I'm going to say um I don't see any difference towards the value that a public sector would use it for or the private sector would use it for in its initial state um we might actually find that if you did a proper economic value of it that the private sector would get more value from it because it's providing it for more people so that's um that's where I want to stay start with so I do think it's really important that we understand the value but I think as scientists if we have the concept of societal benefit at the back of our mind, which we should always have, and knowing that climate change is always going to be, um, uh, it, it, that climate services are going to be even more important, that our job is to sell the value of it if we're selling something to the public sector. Whilst it's interesting for us to explore the way that the commercial market can exploit these things, because my feeling is, It'll, what will happen is exactly like something like the health sector, where you have public sector provision, it's very good, top quality, but there's always people that want more, so they buy into the private. And that's, the, it's not necessary, like the information that's provided at baseline is excellent. This is what we're interested in. And the, the commercial sector, like private healthcare, has to understand what, been, what added extra they can give to actually make a commercial product profit. Does that make sense? So no, I absolutely, yes, yeah. yes, it does. So, yeah, and this is a perfect run up to what I wanted to say. And this is the reaching out to the community. First, why we have put together these two streams, also well, uh, value and business innovation and the market. And the second, why we are here, right? What we expect from the community. So in the first place, exactly like Karin nicely alluded to, I mean, we need to start from the value. We need to understand how this value might be specified, explored and demonstrated. And uh, once this is done, then how this value might be taken up in the different public or private business models. You know that public doesn't speak about business models, but they are business models in terms of, you know, thinking how to justify how to transparently lay out why certain activities are done. And, and this needs to have a similar justification. And then in market, we're looking into how to really lever all these uh, thoughts into creating a market observatory or, or perhaps seeing how being able to observe and monitor the market and the uh, uh, financial flows or the uh, the uh, uh, drivers of that market that that might create so this is this is excellent the uh, you know description of why we have put these two teams together and the second is why we are here i mean we are creating in the climate europe a community a lot of expert of users of anyone who uh, would like to be part of this we are developing uh, um, standards, but standards is a little bit a complex word. It's basically, we start with uh, what we all agree with and try to elaborate what might be the 
uh, good practice examples or inspiring practice examples for the topics that we are developing. And from those, uh, then we uh, developed uh, agreed, bottom-up agreed principles, uh, how certain processes should be designed, evaluated, monitored, assessed, and so on. And eventually, all these might be summarized as a guidance, guidance for uh, for out there, for people who are thinking uh, on the same thing uh, or are trying to promote the same thing. So when we speak about standards, we don't mean uh, ISO standards, uh, not necessary this time, but it's really starting from bottom up what is out there, uh, translating it into what might be useful and uh, what might be inspiring, and eventually uh, ending up with some suggestion, recommendation uh, for others to, to follow. Any thought on that? We are we have three minutes, and I would like to invite both the, uh, the panelists, speakers, but also the audience, if you have any thought on these, uh, how to help us to build this community and make you participate in this. Yeah. I think the scientific community is not the the issue. The uh, the user and perhaps also the private uh, involving the private community somehow is more challenging and uh, not as not as easy. Mm. This is something that Kirsten will always come back to, and I think she's already jotted this in the chat. And she's looking at me as if to say, "Oh goodness, Karen, what are you going to say?" But is that the private sector? is already using these services they just don't term it climate services like they are heavily 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 involved in this it's just not called a climate service so and if you look at it from that perspective part of our job which might be covered in the inventory that tatiana and i are start or that dtu are starting to put together that might help bridge that gap but the private sector is already heavily invested in climate services. They just don't know it. Excellent. Yep. Any more reflection from the audience? And uh, we have uh, one minute left uh, before we are disconnected. If not, then I would uh, again invite everybody uh, to check our booklet. I'm putting it in the chat. Uh, so. After this morning uh, um, brainstorming meetings and the World Cafe, we have a rich program after uh, thematic workshops. Uh, and, uh, and that started at uh, two o'clock. Again, in the same way, you enter into the common uh, uh, share area of the web stool, and then you will choose which uh, of the two parallel workshops to follow. And uh, um, and I know that some of the participants will be talking in the afternoon. So this is really, you know, an invitation once again to everybody to join us also in the afternoon and follow up this discussion. And please stay in touch. Uh, um, we will uh, come up with call for participation and call for evidence. We will ask uh, the community to review whatever we come up with. If you have good ideas, uh, you, are, you might be part of the uh, scoping and the knowledge gathering process. So this is very nice. Karin. And I just finish by uh, thanking you, Yaro and Andreas, for being our fearless leaders and setting up a really wonderful um, uh, session this morning. What people didn't see is the chaos of the Google Meet meeting yesterday, where we were trying to get everything organized. So uh, thanks to both Yaro and Andreas for their patience. Um, this, I think, has been a really successful um uh, a discussion. Thanks. So, uh, hand, clap hands for everyone. <laughs> Kirsten, and of course, this will uh, uh, extend it also to all panelists, excellent talks, and uh, all uh, organizers that we haven't seen uh, are working very hard in the background. Thanks Kirsten. very much to everybody. Bye. Okay. okay. Kirsten, you didn't ask for the floor. I thought no. you, you you did. No work. Excellent. Thank you very much again. And we hope to see you in the afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, and Yaro. have a good day. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. <laughs>
Thank you.